So I'm very excited to uh, be able to bring this topic to you guys today. Um, we have Liam Spradlin, who is going to be our moderator. He is a designer, a designer on my team, the design relations team, and he advocates for material design. Um, he also, previously to Google, was the lead designer at Touch Lab, and he worked with a, a variety of, of companies there, including um, ClassPass, Quartz, uh, Research, Stack, um, a number of others, um, and he uh, has quite a bit of experience with design systems. So, um, very excited to hand it over to him and um, uh, lead you on this journey today. Thank you all. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, like I said, I'm Liam. Thanks for coming. Uh, we have a panel of folks who have approached design systems from a variety of different angles. So I'm interested to dig into not only their experiences, but also uh, how design systems influence and are influenced by the larger systems of the world around us. So we're going to start with, the with a quick set of intros from each panelist, uh, then a discussion and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Hi, I'm Dave Chu. I'm an uh, interaction design lead on the material design system. Uh, prior to Google, I was an associate creative director at Frog Design, which is a global innovation consultancy, which is a sort of fancy way of saying that I got to work on some cool projects ranging from uh, theme parks and cruise lines to distribution centers and power plants. Unfortunately, because Frog is a design consultancy. I can't actually show you any of the work, but I can kind of describe a little bit of it to you and how it relates to design systems, which I'll do in a moment. Um, after Frog, I joined Android UX at Google, where I started working on material design. Uh, we launched that in uh, 2014, and this year in May at I.O., we launched a major update to material design, including material theming, material components, and uh, tools, including a gallery and um, theme editor. So at Frog, I worked on a whole range of design systems, ranging from things that maybe are basically style guides, so color palettes and typography and maybe a PowerPoint template that we needed to use uh, for the deliverable. Uh, I also worked on sort of more robust design language systems, uh, including for Disney. Uh, that had to range from work, uh, working in your home when you're making a reservation for your, uh, for your trip to all the sort of touch points in, in the park itself to really highly themed environments where um, you don't really want to break the illusion that you're in, so you don't want a really futuristic interface in a Wild West theme, for example. Um, and yet we need to re remain consistent uh, throughout. Um, I also worked for GE. Uh, we worked on, which you may, well, you may be familiar with GE. They make a lot of products like uh, jet engines and medical imaging devices and trains and uh, uh, power plants. Um, they also happen to be, at least at the time, the 14th largest software developer in the world. Um, so this is a really interesting problem for them because they had this diverse range of products, uh, but a, real, a need for sort of this consistent um, way of delivering uh, experience across all of them. And you might think of this as well like a pilot or somebody who's working on a technician who's working on a jet engine doesn't really need to have a consistent experience with a medical imaging device. Uh, but if you think of this more from a corporate perspective, there's a need to kind of promote the same brand throughout the entire product, regardless of vertical, as well as the ability to develop uh, easily, uh, sort of have this kit of parts. Um, so my team and I, we went into uh, power plants and we looked at sort of what the operators were doing on their uh, monitors, what, what are executives doing and looking, what kind of information were they looking for. Um, we identified patterns and sort of archetypes of users and um, we're able to sort of look across verticals and see that, yes, there actually are sort of universal um, patterns of, of types of information that are needed and our user archetypes, problem solvers, decision makers, and the types of information that they needed. Um, and this is sort of all went to this kit of parts for GE to be able to develop regardless of the, of the vertical. Um, and now at Google, um, I develop and author the material design guidelines. So that ranges from very concrete, small things like buttons and dialog boxes, all the way up to really high level sort of conceptual models. And one of the unique things about materials that it, is that it has this very rationalized system. It has this conceptual model that helps to ground the entire uh, system. So uh, that's basically a simulated three-dimensional environment, lighting that sort of shines on surfaces that have different elevations, and they cast shadows. And that helps to inform users of how these things should uh, work uh, based on their knowledge of how things work in the real world. Um, 
I also answer lots of questions. Uh, we try to be robust with our guidance, but there's ine inevitably, you know, what about this use case, and can we do this with, with this particular component? Um, and the challenge there is really zooming out. You know, there's a product team that has this question we have to ask, is it just this product, or does it span a number of products? And beyond that, is it just this platform, or is it multiple platforms? The material is delivered across, you know, iOS, Android, web, and Flutter. So we're really looking at the level of an ecosystem, which I think is a unique aspect of material. Uh, my name is Gina Ann. Um, right now, I'm a senior design system lead at Amazon. Um, we're working on a brand new product that hasn't released yet, so unfortunately, I can't tell you a thing about it, but I can tell you about some other things I've done. Uh, previously, I was at Salesforce for five and a half years. Um, I was the lead designer and one of the founding members of the Lightning Design System there. There's a couple other founding members of that team in this room, which is really awesome. Uh, a decade ago, I worked on the Apple Online Store when that still existed. Now it's all kind of merged in their marketing site. But I led the CSS architecture, uh, which had to scale across multiple countries, uh, consumer stores, business-to-business -business stores, education stores, and so on. Um, and then after a year of that, I decided to switch over to the UX team. And there I documented visual uh, design patterns for the online store. Um, I really love design systems so much so that I'm very uh, involved in the community. So I did found one of the, actually the first design systems conference called Clarity here in San Francisco. Um, on the third year now, it's going to be in New York. Actually, Jesse's speaking this year, coincidentally. Um, so hi, Jesse. Um, and I also run the design system Slack, which has, I think, about almost 8,000 people in there. Um, the Medium publication, I co-wrote the Design Systems Handbook, yada, yada, yada. I've <laughs> done a lot of um, stuff. So I mentioned I worked on the Lightning Design System. Um, this is the current front page. Um, I didn't actually work on this one. This is just what's out now. Um, but I um, did all sorts of things from helping plan the thing, figuring out what it is, um, you know, Designing uh, the site, designing, uh, working with the designers on the components themselves, uh, being an internal advocate across multiple design teams, being an external advocate, preaching the gospel of the Lightning Design System. Um, I did front end code. Um, I did all sorts of stuff. So that was a really, really awesome job, <laughs> I have to say. Um, Ten years ago, as I mentioned, I worked on the Apple Online Store, and so when I started, the store was still only 640 pixels wide, still used spacer gifts. Anyone remember those? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was who led the uh, design of, or the, the web standards movement for the Apple Online Store, and so um, that was definitely where I really cut my teeth on a lot of this stuff. Um, so... Um, I've been doing style guides, um, this kind of stuff, since like 2004. I was a design intern at a marketing agency in Memphis, Tennessee, called Odin. And I did it in Quark, believe it or not. But I was still, uh, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but I was still documenting CSS, um, as well as you know the grids and the typography, color, all that stuff. Um, but that's where I kind of really figured out that I dig this stuff. Um, I've also done it for various startups, uh, agencies. Uh, some, I, I've even done some like consulting where I just give people feedback on their design system. Um, but I will say it was my work at Apple, Salesforce, and now what I'm doing at Amazon that really um, helped me understand the complexity of scaling design systems across an enterprise or across an ecosystem. Um, and I've been speaking and writing about this stuff for like over 10 years. So hi, <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> Hi everyone. My name's Jesse Reed. Uh, so I'm I'm the non-tech designer person on this panel. Uh, I'm a primarily a branding or identity designer. Um, during the day, uh, I work at my company, which is called Order, uh, which myself and my partner Hamish Smythe founded um, after working at Pentagram for six years. We worked for Michael Beirut. Uh, and, you know, we did things like uh, I worked on the Hillary Clinton campaign. He did the MasterCard identity, um, various other like nonprofits, educational institutions. Um, but I think I'm here because uh, when we were at Pentagram, 
Hamish and I started this small little publishing company called Standards Manual. Um, it started off as a one-off kind of Kickstarter campaign to republish uh, the New York City Transit Authority Graphic Standards Manual designed by Massimo Vignelli and Bob Norda of Unimark. And now it's turned into this much larger imprint. Um, and we have five titles that we've published to date, um, including uh, the NASA Graphic Standards Manual, the EPA Manual, um, and then a few others that aren't standards manuals but are somewhat design system related or just archival pieces of graphic design. So I'm kind of like the library, the librarian of standards manuals, I guess you could say. Um, so here's just one of images of the uh, the Vignelli Transit Authority Standards Manual, which is kind of this first time that you know uh, Swiss modernism was introduced in the United States for one of the largest public transportation systems in the country. Um, and so the whole point of our imprints and what we do is archiving this information um, and really making it accessible to a public, um, especially a younger public that didn't have access to it before. Um, and then the EPA identity system and that manual designed by Chermayef and Geismar uh, is another one that will be published and another interesting sort of example of what we now consider flexible identity systems, and this is sort of the analog version of that before um, we had motion or animation or you know digital movement that you can make things flexible very quickly. Um, this was a much more extensive uh, you know example of that that was all done by hand. So um, we republish books like that and um, think that's really important to do um, for future generations. So. Uh, the, our, like I said, the, the point of what we're doing and the reason we're doing it is to educate designers, whether it's just young designers, students, um, designers who started in one area of design and transitioned into another one. And so they somehow have an interest in design systems. Um, I kind of call them legacy systems. So I think those are really important to not forget about. These things had to be kind of figured out um, actually in person, like the transit authority system, for example, they spent you know, months of underground actually following passengers on where they would uh, you know, uh, you know, switch trains, what staircases they would take, et cetera. So um, the biggest kind of problem we see with younger designers is their lack of education, and we are trying to change that. So that's all. Uh, so my name's Ken. Uh, let's see if we get to the slide. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a group creative lead here at the, at the Google uh, in a part of the company called uh, Google Brand Studio. Um, there's a couple of things that, uh, that I'm tasked with, but one of them is like I, I lead a cross-functional team. That means it could be a mix of strategists, designers, UX people, um, IAs, et cetera. Um, and developers often as well. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the remit that I have right now is the looking into the execution of identities and systems for Google uh, and for Alphabet as well. Um, and so one of the things that our team has actually developed is the unified global brand standards for Google. Um, it actually, that actually wasn't a thing, shocking enough, uh, when I started Google four years ago, there wasn't actually a, a rallying point for guidance for Google and how we executed things on a, on a kind of a global brand level. And so our team has actually built that platform. We expanded and we, we work closely with the material team and a bunch of other teams within the org to, to, to make sure that everything that we do is kind of stemming from the same thing. We're all drinking from the same fountain, so to speak. Um, um, prior to this uh, Google adventure that I'm on now, uh, I, was, I was also an associate creative director at Frog. Um, Dave and I didn't quite overlap because I was actually in the Munich studio and he was in SF. Um, but there was a lot, of, a lot of things that were happening. And then when I was there, I was doing lots of um, UX leading systems work, leading product work that involved um, crafting what, what event was the Siemens version of what Slack became, um, and then also looking into things like rebuilding airlines experiences, et cetera. Um, and then before that, I was working at a, another branding agency in Munich called KMS Team, um, doing more branding as one might expect at a branding agency. But, um, some of the more interesting things I got to work on was there was the, uh, I worked on some stuff for Porsche Design. I worked on some stuff for, of course, beer. Um, and I also worked on a, a did a lot of did a lot of pitch work that now lives in a PDF somewhere that never saw the light of day. But I guarantee you, it, it's amazing. <laughs> um, and then I also did a stint at, at Landor, where I um, I had the pleasure of designing uh, identity and packaging systems anywhere from Old Spice to always. Um, 
it was it was a wild ride, guys. <laughs> um, so. Again, what that means, as I mentioned, um, you know, I, I lead a lot of these things, and here's kind of a snapshot of the thing that our team has done. Um, you know, anything from, again, like the, the standards work and how Google communicates itself, um, again, as a global entity across all of the various things. Um, and the, one of the key things that we, we talk a lot about is stepping out of the functional silos of our organization. You know, we're, we're, we're very product, and there's product and there's marketing. That's, that's the binary way that we're, we're structured. But, you know, part of it is coming at it like users, users don't think of it like that. They come at it from, you know, they're like, it's Google. You know, they don't, they don't visit a marketing site and like, oh, the marketing team did this. It's, it's allowed to be different. Um, so our, our idea was to rally around that. And again, like working with the material team has been great because we have a lot of that product stuff that, that comes in there and we're a uh, united front. I also worked on parts of the, the Google store. Um, we developed some, some external expressions that, uh, it's kind of saw the light of day. Um, but also aside from that is like you know, when Alphabet became a thing, um, I, our team actually led the creation of the Alphabet identity. Um, Larry and Sergey have very specific feedback about the color red that I know now by heart. But we also looked into the other Alphabet companies like Capital G, um, like Waymo, like um, a sl Verily and a, and a smattering of others. And then to kind of round it out, you know, we, we were looking into how do we communicate privacy and security and what does that mean when it comes to our brand. We also do some fun things like crafting a compendium of all the Google Doodles or even thinking about icon language um, across the entire company right now. Um, and so then, you know, again, just kind of a snapshot. This is, this is the kind of stuff that I get to look at all day. Um, there's some familiar faces out in the crowd that are looking at this stuff with me every day. Um, and it's great, you know, and, and when we crafted this guidelines platform, which you can kind of see there on the right, again, it's, it's nothing new in a lot of ways um, other than that, like, it's a central repository. But one of the key things that we do when we think about it is, yes, we want to make sure that we have the, the design systems in place. Yes, we want to make sure that we're communicating things in a, I, I always um, emphasize coherency, um, but we wanted to make sure that we were baking in tools as, as opposed to just beating people over the head with a bunch of guidelines Bibles. I love guidelines Bibles. I love the work that Jesse's doing. Um, but there's a flexibility of what we need in today's kind of fast-paced environment that, unfortunately, as lovely as those artifacts are they, they don't they don't do that and so we you know we built an interactive componentry we built in a lot of um, tools and guidance and things like that that to help people contextualize and understand what's going on and also tell the Australian team that they should not be putting the Google logo on speedos don't <laughs> do that um, that was a real thing um, <laughs> And so again, I you know I, I kind of already went through this, but you know I you know I cut my teeth building brands um, and packaging systems and things like that. And I was um, I was actually I remember when I started at Frog and like there was this thing where a lot of designers were talking about like hey we need to do design systems, and it kind of blew my mind because I'm like well that's what design's always been as far as I'd always thought about it. It's like you go back to like you know what was happening in the in the 60s as, as Jesse mentioned and. The design system has always been a thing, um, and you know, thanks to, thanks to the likes of like Carl Gerstner and, and others. Um, and so, but uh, you know, and as a medium, I always think of design as being rooted in in like this this notion of constraint. We're not. I don't think we're artists. We can have a beer and we can talk about it, but like we're rooted in constraints. And I think the one of the things to that I, I really push my team on is like, let's not get all caught up on the idea of consistency. Let's always hammer on the idea of coherency. We're building experiences that span massive amounts of touch points, massive amount of audiences types, and it has to feel the same in the way that, you know, I can show up tomorrow and wear a different shirt and you'll still recognize me, more or less. Um, and so every day I'm working with teams inside the Google to, to understand that, like, these are the fundamentals that we've created and, and how do they actually support Google's scale and breadth and the things that we're trying to do. Uh, so to start out with, I want to kind of get a handle on uh, a design system's place in the world. This is maybe kind of a broad question, but I'm interested in uh, the ways in which the design systems that we either create or curate uh, fit into the larger context of the world that we live in. So thinking beyond devices um, into things like the built environment and our everyday experience as humans. Uh, so I think the literal answer to that, probably for the work that I do, is that sort of any digital experience can use our design system since we are on mobile devices or websites. Um, they kind of could be anywhere in the world. Um, the more sort of theoretical aspect of this, I think, is um, two things that come to mind. One is, you know, a design system in a way, or at least what we provide um, as, as a toolkit, 
it's it's a sort of almost a way of helping developers like structure information, like how to think through a problem, how to present content to people. Um, we're sort of providing them with a framework, you know, literally with a grid, but also with components and perhaps patterns and flows. Um, the flip side of that too is also we're sort of helping users understand what is available. What can this app do? You know, these are patterns and and um, sort of consistent uh, markers or visual clues as to you know what is available. What, uh, what can I do here? What what um, what capabilities? What sort of things does does this app do? Um, and so it's, it's sort of sense making in a way. Um, and so I think this is the thing that I kind of always hit on is sort of this consistency. Um, as opposed to coherency, but the consistency piece of just sort of behavior being consistent because you start getting unexpected uh, things happening, especially in digital spaces, it becomes very confusing quite qu quickly. You know, it's funny. I, we have this kind of conversation a lot. Uh, we used to do a lot more signage and wayfinding. At Pentagram, we've kind of stopped doing it because it takes 10 years to finish a project. But um, we've noticed that normal people, uh, one, don't read signs, and they don't really care about design systems themselves. I mean, they just want to get to point A to point B and not get lost. But they're not looking at signs and thinking, damn, that's a good design system. Like, <laughs> but I'm going to miss my flight. But let me look at this system. They just really don't, don't care. And they shouldn't be distracted by the system. So it should almost be this invisible, functional uh, flow that in this, you know, kind of, uh, you know, course that they're taken on without being distracted by design. So I kind of think um, that, you know, we're here in San Francisco and in New York and we like design and we're kind of always thinking about iconography and the ways that, you know, icons and type and color and all these things are very considered, but just normal people um, don't think about that. And I think that's a kind of consideration that we really need to um, always keep in the backs of our heads about uh, not over designing things, but really just making them work. And I know that sounds kind of boring, but um, again, if you're just wanting to get to somewhere in the airport or somewhere in a city that you've never been before, um, no one gives a shit about, you know, how beautiful that serif typeface is. So, um, yeah, so I think, you know, uh, we need to not always think about it as designers, but as about pedestrians as well. Not to be pessimistic. <laughs> I'm also interested in kind of the flip side of that relationship where, uh, the, the world influences the design system. So what kind of considerations have to be made? Or, you know, uh, Jesse, what have you learned from your work cataloging, like, the NYCTA, for instance, about, like, how the ways in which people interact with the world influence how the design system is structured? Well, one thought about that, and or an example I can give, if anyone has been to New York within the past couple years, and I don't keep, uh, keep on talking about projects that I've worked on, but at Pentagram, we did work on um, this pedestrian wayfinding system um, that's above ground. And so if you are in New York City anytime soon or um, have seen these, they're big kind of monolithic structures of maps um, that are printed. They're not digital maps. Um, and so everyone kept on asking, you know, is there going to be a digital component or is there some sort of link between those maps in your phone or apps or things like that? And the point of those maps were actually to um, get people off of their phones and be a little bit more comfortable in a very daunting city. And so uh, they were kind of intended for you to look at this map and understand that, you know, you're within a 15 minute radius and these are sort of the um, landmarks that you're going to encounter. Uh, but just to be a little more more comfortable um, l actually looking for things, you know, up above, you know, looking down at your phone. So I think there is this interaction between uh, using, you know, physical environments in cities uh, to make people feel comfortable um, rather than just kind of uh, relying on them that they'll figure it out by looking on their phone. So those maps are something that were influenced uh, and they look exactly like the underground system, which again is this familiar design system. So the point of like linking the underground with above ground was really important because if you have been to New York before, if you were to design those signs that looked, um, I don't know, just completely different, you use, you know, pink and again, like serif typography versus black and white, these kind of thin horizontal rules and that kind of design language, um, it would really be jarring to someone, I think, trying to figure out the, the two. So I think there is a, a link there. Sure. 
I think ultimately, <clears throat> like the notion of a design system, yeah, I don't like. I wouldn't expect like my my grandfather to be like that's a killer system to like to Jesse's point. I think the idea is that. Like really, like with all things in life, it comes to like managing user expectations or managing expectations, right? And Dave touched on this with the notion of like behavioral um, consistency. Um, I, I agree with that 100 percent. You want you want to make sure that whatever that it, be it the the execution of the system or be it the effect that the real world has on the system, it's that notion of predictability, right? So I should know when I look at a sign, if I see that sign in another context, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to elicit the same amount of information from it. And I think when we think about real world context, it's about always t twisting it. It's like build the system to make sure that you're communicating appropriately, that's our job, we're communicators, and then twist it around and make sure that when someone engages with it in the environment that it exists, be it digital, be it physical, be it, it, be it in a book, like a table of contents, that you're, you're giving them the appropriate cues and that you've considered that context so that there is that level of predictability in the way that it's used. And then, then you can actually begin to measure the success or, or the weaknesses in the system that you've created. Obviously, um, you know, travel is always a good example. Like I also think of Virgin America, rest in peace. Um, I was a huge fan of that system. Everything from the cups to the boarding passes to the plane itself, even their uniforms, like everything was really stellar. Um, but um, one of the things I found really interesting um, is so coming from being a web and software systems designer, now going into organizing conferences, um, thinking about my conference in a um, systematic way, but also um, an, as a user experience. And so, you know, color coding the lanyards based on your preferences on whether you want to be photographed or not, I think is really important because there are people that are comfortable with it, people that are not. Um, making sure that I, um, you know, take care of the speakers. Do they want to bring up a significant other? Do they need childcare? Like that whole whole thing. And so it's been interesting, like thinking about um, a real life space um, through the lens that I know through user experience design. Um, and I think like anytime I've attended a conference that I've really enjoyed, I think it's because they've thought through all those details like that. I'm also interested in uh, kind of zooming in on this topic a little bit to talk more about brand and identity, um, which beyond kind of conveying utilitarian info, like where you are or where you're going, um, there's something kind of intrinsic in the presentation of that information that conveys identity as well. So I'm interested to hear how identity uh, and brand fit into that interplay that we just discussed. Um, and also if there are examples of when an identity has had to change or adapt based on results of how it was used in the world. We have a client right now that is a, a large cultural institution in New York. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but they're in an interesting uh, sort of position where they've gone through, they're very well known. Um, everyone knows their name. They say their name differently sometimes. Um, but uh, they've gone through a, uh, a, you know, a design sort of um, shift, and they've ended up with very, you know, templated uh, pieces for, for advertising, both web, physical, out of home, um, and those things. And they've, they're, it's so rigid that after two years of using it, um, they're feeling very stuck and repetitive. And internally, it becomes very boring for those designers to keep on making things that while it looks consistent and recognizable, it's no longer fun for the individuals creating it. So um, it just brings up an interesting question for all of us to think about the dilemma of an internal team having to design within a system versus the public uh, recognizing the system and recognizing brands and identity um, because you know to someone using a, a template or um, a very rigid system over and over again yes that can become monotonous 
but only for you. And then someone visiting a city like New York, they see uh, consistency in a name or an identity and a you know a place that they're going, and that brings them comfort. Um, I mean, kind of like uh, you know Starbucks, whether or not you like it or hate it, if you're in some weird you know small town in the Midwest, uh, but they have a Starbucks, you don't know where to get coffee, you see it and you feel comfortable and it kind of draws you to that because it's the same thing uh, that you've seen if you're in San Francisco or you're in New York or you're in Amsterdam or wherever. So uh, it's just, you know, I think there's constantly a uh, struggle with um, brands and these institutions to, uh, you know, to always be fresh and to reinvent themselves, but I think that can actually hurt brand consistency and brand awareness and comfortability um, by doing that. So too much change really disrupts uh, recognition. And so I guess I don't really have an answer, but it's just this, uh, this uh, constant parallel um, struggle that I keep on seeing with identities and brands go through in-house in teams versus the audience. <clears throat> and, and and a lot of what, what what Jess is getting at, I think, also starts to build on the notion of. Um, uh, I mean, we talk a lot about this, like the notion of assurance cues or even brand signaling. Like, what are those? What are those markers uh, of a brand or of any type of experience that you want to make sure that are that are kind of carry carry on throughout? <clears throat> and so we, we think a lot about that inside of uh, inside of the walls here, but we also try to figure out how does that how does that translate. And I think of some past stuff I've worked. Usually, like when you talk about the idea of a a brand changing, I was I, trying to go through my lexicon of like of shoddy memories and um, of brands that have maybe have basically been affected by by user feedback or some type of real life thing. I couldn't think of anything because most of the things that I've been involved in before I was uh, part of Google was uh, essentially it was like some type of leadership change that then actually they're like, oh, I want to make sure that my imprint is known here as I'm a leader and I want to actually change the way the brand is. So it was less about like user shifting it and more about um, a leadership or an executive type of decision to signal change or, or business needs um, in a lot of ways, yeah, right? So that's an example of yeah, there you go, right? Um, and so, and, 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 and I think of like when you start to think about the idea of, of how these things are expressed, that's why I, in, from a visual perspective, I, oh, I, that's why I get obsessed a little bit about the notion of coherency, because I think that's, we have to make sure that we have an, an inherent flexibility in the systems, in the way that these things are expressed. Um, and that varies, you know, depending on what you're building. You know, we have Google, we do things, and if you work at Nike, like Nike does different things. And one, one of my favorite examples actually was an identity I always, I can't ever say the name, it's some Dutch museum, but it was like in the late 80s, early 90s with Vim Kral and 8VO, and they developed, this, uh, they developed this amazing system, and the thing about the system, the only thing that held it together was that they used Futura. And so you can imagine eight, late 80s to 90s design, um, it, it traversed all of those trends, and it looks completely nutty, and it's a museum, they can get away with these kinds of things. Um, but every, the, 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 the thread through it was the, the consistency of using a singular typeface, and that was one of their key visual drivers, coupled with a verbal strategy that hung it all together. And I think it's, it's thinking about those moments and how does that actually affect the way that we build brands, the way that we think about it, and, and those brand signaling and assurance cues. So we've touched on uh, this kind of relationship between two, I guess, theoretical parties, the world and the design system itself. Um, but I want to recognize a third party here, which is the creator or the maker behind the design systems. Um, and I'm interested to hear everyone's thoughts on how we can recognize and account for uh, the things that we're bringing to the system. So how our own experiences or biases uh, affect the design system and how we can recognize that and remain accountable. There's a balance between bringing experience with you and bringing opinion with you. Um, I'm dealing with that right now at Amazon. Like, here's things I know worked at Salesforce versus, well, you know, here's what I think is always going to be the answer no matter what. Um, you know, maybe that's a little bit more on the side of opinion. Um, one of the things that I worked with the team on was um, our core principles at the very beginning. And one of our fourth principle actually is flexibility, because that was very, very important to the team, is that they could use the design system but be very flexible. Um, so I find myself like um, definitely, uh, you know, 
trying to bring that experience that I know is true, like things around accessibility and things around like tried and tested practices, but then letting go where I can um, with the team um, on things that maybe aren't really that important and allow room for expression and, and um, uh, innovation. Um, so that's something that I definitely, I don't think I'm perfect at it. I definitely find my, catch myself being like, no, 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 we have, and then I'm like, nope, no, that's not important. <laughs> um, so, and I think that's important as a systems designer or a systems developer to bring to whatever company you go to. Every time you go to a different company, it's like you're immersing yourself in a brand new culture and you're always going to bring things with you, but there's also going to be things to take on at that new culture that you're in. I think one of the things that we've come to recognize, or at least I've sort of trying, been trying to promote within our within material design, at least, is you know when we've launched the product. I, I guess I, let me step back. I think that, that the principle really is like trying to be reflective as a designer and and really think you know look at what you made and then sort of you know be open to sort of ex, um, exploring maybe where there could be additional edge you know growth edges. Um, I think you know the. The example I was going to have is sort of having published material in 2014. Um, you kind of look at, you know, what is the grid that we're producing? Well, it's for Latin text. Um, it's, you know, it's not necessarily dealing with, a den with the density that maybe other languages and or characters might be needing to use. And you know, these are these are tough questions for how do we sort of integrate them into their design system. So that's those are things that we're trying to uh, focus on. Um, but I think there's these inherent biases or inherent sort of worldviews that perhaps that we have to also question. You know. We've all grown up, I would venture, in this room with you know, desktop computers, and you, you're sort of familiar with what a button is, right? Um, and we've been able to move from this very sort of maybe more um, literal representation of what a button is, maybe skeuomorphic even, to very abstract and conceptual, like it's just capitalized text in a particular position on the page. And you sort of are supposed to know that you can click on that thing to do something. Um, when you start looking at markets where people are using mobile phones, and that's the very first time they've been exposed to computing, these are concepts that are radic you know, they're radical. They're, they're not something that people have even, like, it's a new, new concept. And so how can we sort of help those folks sort of ramp up to sort of where we are in terms of understanding how computing, you know, these, these um, concepts in, in user interfaces, you know, work, uh, how they work and, and what people should be expecting from, from the interfaces that they use. Um, yeah, so those, those are some of the things that we're trying to figure out how to uh, integrate into the design system and, and make it more flexible so that we are able to address, like, the, everyone in the world. It's not just sort of people of a certain background. It's funny, you know, like Dave and like the, the world that Dave's in, the world that I'm in, like they're 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 very much related to each other. So I'm just going to yes and um, onto that one. Uh, so it, one of the things that we we also try to think about is like. Um, is how can we use technology and an understanding of technology to kind of help us solve some of these problems? Um, <clears throat> you know, when, when we're crafting a system. So one of the things that's inside of the the standards work that I'm also part of is kind of like the, it's a sibling to the material side, but it's much more focused on establishing a system for um, for the communications aspect of of Google. So outside of its product communications, but much more in, inside of these communications things. And so when you start to get to notions of like localization, which can be great and also uh, like it can be it can be one of those things like you don't know what you're getting into and it's very icebergy and there's a thing and you're under the water. Um, and so like uh, to kind of make it real, there's a moment where we were like we're creating a type scale and I'm getting fussy about letting and all these things. And I'm like, OK, that's great. But now let's look at this in Vietnamese. And suddenly when you look at it in Vietnamese, everything clashes together because together, you have all of these kind of like um, accents that sit on top of the characters and they can't you can't work with it with a denser letting. And so then we start to think about, well, like, OK, well, we could have a universal type scale or what's another thing and, and being armed with a very naive um, knowledge of things like CSS I'm like wait a minute can't you target languages and so then we can start to get into that like how do technology help us support these things so we don't we, we're not they're considered but we use technology as a means to not making a lowest common denominator but use it to that advantage to make sure that it works um, in something just like crafting a system and having language targeted um, um, line heights and things like that the other the other two things that we work a lot with which will they none, none of these are shockers as far as I'm concerned one is like Google's into data and so I'd like to 
you know, when, when I'm when I'm working within our team, uh, you know, I like to think of us as almost being like design scientists. So like, okay, let's let's craft a vision, let's figure out a hypothesis for how this works, and now let's go test it, and let's figure out how we test it in a way that I don't want to live and die by numbers, but what I want to do is I actually want to get this in front of people and talk about it and figure out what are the things that we didn't think about and feed that back in. So as a creator of a system or a maintainer of a system, that becomes something that's very important to, to make sure that the health and vitality of that system goes on. And then the other thing, which is, like, there's a couple of moments where I came and it was like, oh my God, why didn't we do this sooner? It's, it's the contextualization of it. So instead of just, you know, hey, we just spit out a bunch of guidelines, go follow them. It's put it in a context, explain it. What are best practices? How do you use it? Show a thing, be it real or not. And I actually, I, uh, I think I'm constantly looking at the material team because they do a fantastic job of that. They always put their stuff in a context that helps you um, really kind of understanding grok what they're getting at as opposed to like, oh, here's a button and like go forth. I want to move into how design systems impact teams and organizations um, in a practical sense. So I'm interested to hear, I think most of us have experience introducing design systems to teams um, or entire organizations. Uh, so I'm interested to hear some of the practical effects that you've seen in that process. So I'll, I'll talk mostly to my time at Salesforce, because I think that's probably the, the bulk of, of um, learning about that. There are a lot of different factors. Um, you know, and obviously, there's the initial phase of trying to convince people um, why this is important. But like, let's, let's assume you've already got the buy-in. Everybody's using the system and is aware of the system. Um, what I found really exciting was when I would be in a meeting, and a question was asked, and I didn't have to answer the question because somebody else would jump in with like, oh, we'll use this pattern, or here's the accessibility rule around that thing. And so it basically uh, elevates the entire organization um, to uh, be better designers um, in terms of like the interaction patterns and the consistency and all that stuff, or coherency, my bad. Um, <laughs> Um, but I also found um, there were a lot of things that kind of came on as sort of like extra benefits. So um, one of the junior designers at the, I, th I think at the time she was a junior designer, maybe uh, staff level, um, she was so excited about it because it actually helped her move faster. Um, she even wrote a Medium post about how it helped onboard her as a new designer into our culture because she got to get up to speed very quickly on why we do things, um, what all the different um, pieces are. She didn't have to think about how many pixels something was. Instead, she could talk about user flows and actual like features. Um, so you get all kinds of benefits around that. Um, you like what I found is really awesome is um, when you really get yourself into like doing systems, you find yourself not just um, thinking about like the pixels and the patterns and all that, but like actually trying to make people's jobs easier. Um, at least that's why I really enjoy what I do. And so I've been um, really intrigued by this um, kind of fairly new. Uh, rise in what people are calling design operations right now because I'm really interested in like helping improve the culture as a whole. Um, and yeah, I definitely care about colors and space and all that stuff. But like if I know that the work that we're doing is making everybody, and when I say everybody, I mean everybody, designers, developers, product managers, copywriters, um, everybody, um, work faster and more efficiently and, and align together. Um, as Cameron Mole said in one of his talks, it was like all about uniform or uh, unity over uniformity, which kind of is like the coherency over consistency. Um, I really think that's really exciting. Um, and so um, that's where my intrigue is with like the people part of it. Yeah. Um I agree with all of that. And the one thing that I've learned, um, right, the point is to make people's jobs easier. I like that's exactly what we say whenever we go into a new client meeting and they're kind of we're talking about brand manuals and systems and how this is going to um, you know add some value to your company, the client. And so what we've learned is just involving people from the very, very beginning 
at every level of the company, whether they're, they think they're a designer, whether they have a design background or not, um, really listening to them and what their needs are, what they do on a daily basis. Those are the first things that we ask um, you know, a group uh, within a, a team or a client that we're working with on how can we just help you do things quicker and faster and not having to start from scratch every time. So just involving and listening to um, every level of an organization um, is incredibly, I think, beneficial not only to have it work, but to have buy-in. I mean, as identity brand designers, the, the easy part is design. The hardest part is having everyone agree that this is a good thing, that, you know, whether you're a 10-person company or, a, you know, 500-person company, that this is going to be a good thing for everyone that we're going to agree to do. Um, and, you know, one interesting story that I have, so one of the books that we published was the NASA um, Identity Guidelines, um, Richard Daney. Uh, I don't know if anyone went to the Clarity Conference, but he spoke, that was it last year? It was the first year. First year, yeah. So Richard Daney was the design director of the, the NASA WORM Identity, um, and along with Bruce Blackburn, who was his partner. And he told us this story, I don't think it's in a video, but about when um, you know that work was created, they sort of did it in a silo. They were, they were hired by NASA, um, and there was you know, a very small team involved, which can be good. I don't think you know, having every, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen is, is a good thing. But um, it was done in a silo and the work was very, you know, smart and they, they did a very thorough uh, process to get to that solution. Um, and it was very systematic. I mean, they basically took uh, a hodgepodge of uh, you know, things that were being created within NASA by freelancers and, you know, there's many divisions across the country, many offices, they're all be being designed different ways. So he really, you know, they really came in and created a design system, but where it sort of went wrong was when they deployed the entire system to everyone at NASA, they simply did it by sending everyone new letterheads. So everyone gets into work on Monday, they open up their mail and they have new letterheads with this red squiggly logo on it that says NASA and you know people that knew the old NASA sort of brand which they maybe didn't call it a brand back then they had an allegiance to that and once you change it that really you know pe people are emotional about the places they work and the things that they use every day um, so when that was deployed people were really angry so he had to go him and Bruce around the entire country to every single NASA office to represent the system and once they presented the system and explained why it worked and why you know, uh, making a decision about what paper stock to buy because it's going to save us, you know, thousands of dollars down the road because we don't have to, you know, figure this out every time and waste money on whatever different paper stocks or inks. Um, they really got it and they signed off right, right away. But had they been involved in the beginning, it wouldn't have been so hard of a sell. So um, people are emotional about these things. So I would suggest involving them. And um, kind of on that note of involving people and getting people on board, uh, Dave, I'm interested in the ways in which material manages to reach different audiences. So it's kind of unique in that it both reaches outwards to the designers and developers and other makers of the world who can use the system, but also inward to internal teams at Google. Uh, so I'm interested in kind of the approach the material takes to both of those and kind of balancing them. I mean, we have the fortune, good fortune of being sort of part of Google. So it's the challenge of sort of, um, you know, broadcasting that we have a design system is not, is sort of not as difficult as maybe uh, it might be in other cases. So, you know, we have some very large public platforms with like IO and uh, design.google and, and sort of certainly all the social networks. Um, so I think that for, again, sort of because it's Google, it's a little less challenging. I think the internal um, um, process is, Perhaps been one of um, I would say like v uh, visual argument in a way. It's uh, you know you can kind of put it here's a here's the before and here's the after here's you know choice A and choice B like which do you think looks better and hopefully we've done our job such that it's less of a contentious argument when you actually see the thing. Um, I th we we also have learned you know that it's it's re and lesson learned is you know certainly. You, know, you don't want to come across as like we are designers in our ivory tower telling you how this should be and this is how it will be. Um, it's very much, it needs to be a collaborative process. Um, so there's certainly a lot of effort that we put into outreach to various teams, understanding what their needs are, um, any unique circumstances that we need to address, um, priorities, um, and really look at that, that as a collaboration, as something that we are trying to partner with other teams to help us all become more successful. Um, 
I had some other notes here I think that I was putting down. Uh, let's see. Responsive to feedback, I think, is also another piece. So we're not just sort of dictating. We're also sort of integrating um, feedback and, and continuous sort of improvement to the design system. And I think finally, one of the other pieces that comes to mind is um, just you know leadership uh, in terms of you know we we are lucky to have leadership that values design. I think that's been one of the things that I've appreciated by being at Google is over the last five years I've been here. Um, you know, there's this evolution of design and appreciation of design in the company. So I think it, that has kind of gone throughout the entire uh, organization. And so we do have you know support from leadership that this is important and this is something we need to do. Um, so that's I think that also helps as well. It's not just on us. Cool. And uh, kind of flipping it to the external side, Gina, I'm interested in how you manage to build a community around design systems, both uh, just as a concept, but also as a specific implementation like Lightning Design. Um, I think it's just because it's that time that everybody is trying to figure this out and everybody is either um, excited about what they just did and want to share with everyone or they're just getting started and they want to know where to where to get started. And so creating these resources and communities for design systems right now was like really great timing because everyone's trying to figure it out. Um, so I mentioned the design system Slack. Um, there's like 8,000 people in there. Um, I love that Slack because I learn so much every single day just reading the conversations that people are having. Um, there's all these like focused channels and because I'm an admin, I'm in every single channel except for the local city channels because that's just way too much noise. Um, but I love just, you know, seeing what people are trying to figure out. Um, and I'm amazed at how on topic and helpful the, um, the conversations usually are. Um, so that's been probably, I would say my, even though like I created the Slack, um, I find it as an, uh, a resource for myself and, um, I'm learning every single day in there. It's really great. Uh, the events are like cool just for, you know, being face to face with people and, um, you know, the talks are always great, but like it's always those conversations that you have with people during the breaks and during lunch where, you know, people are sharing what they're trying to figure out at work right now. And um, sometimes um, maybe people are trying to figure out the exact same thing you're trying to figure out at the same time. And so that's always really cool, too. Um, one kind of like weird meta thought I had, um, I, you know, I, I keep me mentioning cultures and people and stuff because it's been sort of this thing that I've been focused on lately. Um, I um, realized in a way, especially because the design systems community is so open and sharing what they've learned, um, sharing their tools, sharing their resources, open sourcing, writing articles, um, that we're all kind of helping each other uh, figure out um, each other's problems too. And I think that, that there's like something really exciting about that. And it's kind of like a big meta system. <laughs> and we're, even though we all have our own different customers and our own different problems, we are all sort of growing together as, as a community. And I think there's something really exciting about that. Uh, finally, I want to get back into focusing on the end users of a design system, whether that means that they are actively using it to build something or they're just passively using it by existing in the environment. Uh, I'm interested in uncovering any more of the concrete benefits. We discussed how design systems uh, can serve the purpose of making people's work easier when they're creating things, and also how the coherence of a system can help people navigate through uh, the physical world. Um, but is there anything else underneath that that are kind of concrete benefits of a system being established to the end user? Um, well, I, I do want to like piggyback off of a, a point Jesse made earlier that um, I think is important is I think um, a lot of times when you're introducing a system into a new organization, people see that as like, uh oh, the style police are here. Um, <laughs> But what I think is really key is to approach it in a way where everyone is a shared owner of that system. And um, you know, if you if you follow any of Nathan Curtis's work, he's a prolific writer. Um, he's publishing an article, I feel like, every minute about design systems. But he talks about you have your centralized team, and then you could have like a federated team where it's like people that aren't focused on the design system 100%, but they uh, contribute to it. And when you have 
Um, whether you have the centralized team, the federated team, or a combination of the two, which is what we had at Salesforce, um, the key is like that you have everybody contributing and owning decisions together, and it's not like, hey, like you know, you have to do this now. Um, but more of like, oh, here's a new problem that you know we need to introduce a new pattern for this. Let's work on this together. And then um, you know, if you if you are this the systems person, then you can be the one to document it and distribute it. But um, it really needs to be like a shared ownership. I think that's like the really important thing to take away. Uh, yeah, I don't know. If I have one thought on that, uh, this isn't a, a new idea or a new concept, but I think the strength of design systems, whether you know you're talking about a very um, you know an actual design system, whether it's navigation or UI or UX, or simply a really good identity system um, that's used consistently. It, it just helps build trust within the user and for that organization. And so I think the power of a good design system in whatever form it's in is really leveraging um, trust amongst the users. Um, and I think that goes a really long way. So it's kind of like, a, I don't know, you're all probably familiar with this concept. Most of you are maybe designers, uh, even at, you know, at Google. So you kind of understand this. But um, if, if you're, you know, the, you know, now NASA is an example. Uh, my very first job out of college was working at MoMA, and um, Paula Scher redesigned that entire system right before I worked there. And it was a very similar problem that they were having: is that MoMA, you know, a very uh, established museum in New York City. Everyone knows it. They probably know where it is. They know that they can go see really great art there. But when they were seeing, you know, promotions or communications for exhibitions or what have you, everything looked completely different. Some things were, you know, the logo in Franklin Gothic. Some things were from the very beginning using Futura. Uh, and freelancers, again, were doing every single piece of uh, the puzzle. And so what she really did is uh, she, you know, unified an entire system that, yes, there was a template, but then there was like one typeface. It's called MoMA Gothic. Use it all the time. You can fuck it up as much as you want, but as long as you're using it, you're right. And, you know, type is actually another uh, big part of design systems. Systems that I think has a real strength to it. Um, you know whether you're not you're really into typography or or, or you're not, but. Um we have been kind of deploying type as a thing that's so simple where literally it is if you're using this one typeface you're you're correct and if you're not you're wrong and so again the the public sees that and you look and you see that same type and that same combination of type and color and they trust that brand that they know who is speaking to them so um, the, the the takeaway from a design system I think uh, really is establishing trust and that's really important one thing that I'm Anyone that's <laughs> and worked with me or whatever knows that I'm, I'm a bit obsessed with tooling and tools. Um, <clears throat> I talk about it probably too much, and here I am talking about it again. Um, and when I think that's that's one aspect of system execution, system design that uh, I'm constantly trying to work through. And I think there's there's definitely a lot of people that are way smarter than me that are that are solving that. And I think about it in the context of you know n prior to Google built things that were at a certain scale, but being here, you're like. This is, we're not talking about like a couple hundred thousand people. We're talking about millions of people usually that are seeing something, experiencing something. And one of the struggles that we run up against on a consistent basis is that notion of contribution. Not that we have like massive teams that are contributing to things. We have large teams, um, but usually like at least the way that ours works, it's very, it's fairly centralized. We can all like, you know, throw pencils and things at each other, but there's a lot of things that happen to happen, a lot of machinery that has to happen. So if you, the ripple effect, right? Like if, if I'm sitting in a, in a conversation, I'm like, oh, maybe that button should be green now. Now that means how many other things are gonna be affected by changing this green button all the way to, it could be, you know, a sketch file that has it in there to the documentation to the now a developer has to go through they have to update that green and then they've got to test it and so one little thing is now it's a two-month endeavor and sometimes you're just like ah, forget it <laughs> uh, but and that's where I get really intrigued is like well how can we actually have better tooling not only for the execution of systems I could talk about that forever but also in the creation and maintenance of these systems and uh, all of you should follow John Gold on the Twitter, if you don't already. He's a creative technologist at Airbnb. And the things that they're doing in establishing central sources of truth and how that applies to developers and designers, I, I find it fascinating. And I, I can't read enough about it. And the tooling that they're creating where they can actually have a central repository
repository where the code is actually the central source of truth. And then they designers essentially pull from it and, and design files are created from that on the fly and developers are pulling from that. And so they're all, again, that notion of drinking from the same fountain. And so they, and I, you know, they're, they're working on systems too where like there's a push and pull um, and even versioning systems that go to maintaining a massive design system. And it's all based on like, how do we have the tools so that they can actually iterate, work faster, be adaptive. Um, to all of their needs, and I, I'm, I'm constantly just like reading things and trying to figure out like how do we do that within the constraints and realities of the system that we have and our goals and our technological things, um, as opposed to trying to just lift something part and parcel that, that wouldn't work. But I, I think that's one key aspect um, of, of design systems that is fairly new, um, at least in my world, again, from a scale perspective, but I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm really into it. Sure, many of the systems that we've talked about have kind of two sets of users, those being the internal folks who are creating things and the folks who are then experiencing the products that are created from that. Um, Material has a third set of users who are makers that are not internal to Google, who could be working in other companies or other organizations, making pretty much anything. Uh, so I'm interested in kind of framing this question around how Material accounts for that unique position and what kind of influences that has had on the system. I was preparing an answer to the previous question, so uh, sure. Um, I'll answer that question first, I guess, which is I think design, and to kind of bring it back to your original question around um, you know, the impact that design systems have on users, I think is really one of acceleration. Um, reducing friction, you talk about ease of use, um, things, you know, as an interaction designer in particular, I'm doing my job when my work is sort of invisible to the user. You know, when you exit a door and you don't have to think about should I push or should I pull, that's, you know, that's something that, that's the goal, right? It's like you shouldn't be getting in the way unless you're intending to, in, unless you're intending to add friction, you know, you know, do you, are you sure you want to delete that file? Like maybe that's a moment that you want to in, inject some friction, but um, otherwise, you know, I think kind of connecting it back to Ken, you know, these systems that we want to put in place, the infrastructure is really about bringing us consistency to accelerate user interactions with, with design systems, or with, the, with their, excuse me, with, you, with the uh, interfaces that, that users are using. Um, kind of going back to this question around this third sort of type of user that we have, I, I, I think that, um, you know, a design system could simply be, hey, here is here are the red lines, here are the the, the metrics that you need to use to implement a button. Um, but I think kind of kind of got to this earlier. Like we really try to talk about like guidelines. It's almost like teaching. Uh, you know, one is a good place to use this particular approach versus another. And you know, when we think about the entire world uh, and possibly you know billions of people who could potentially be using our our content, you have to expect that there's a wide range of um, levels of education or familiarity with design. So in some ways, we're trying to target people. You know. That, that range, which is a challenging task. And so in some cases, anecdotally, I've heard that you know, the, some folks' uh, ex exposure to design is really through the material design guidelines. That's the first time that these developers in some parts of the world have actually encountered design and these concepts. And so we have some responsibility to kind of not just here's, here's a book of things um, you know, and just you know, implement it. It's really to teach like what are good situations to use this approach versus another. Um, and that's something I'm really kind of interested in bringing to the forefront a little bit more kind of going forward. Is, is, is this design education helping to choose the right component in this particular context? Because I think as professionals, we sort of have this maybe innate knowledge through experience and wisdom that we've gotten through various experiences, you know, of this, this situation is maybe this, this approach is the best one. Um, it's almost a little intuitive. And I think we need, we kind of need to make some of those decisions um, and, the, and the, the factors that kind of go into those decisions a little bit more um, uh, visible to so that other people can kind of equally make good decisions. Great. I think um, I think now I'd like to open it up to the audience. I think we have a little time for a few audience questions. So obviously, you guys talked a lot about uh, sort of layout systems, interaction systems, maybe even you know those are all familiar things. But what are your thoughts on thinking more about a higher order sort of design system, sort of with regard to maybe product or sort of business model, revenue, ethics, and what's the role for designers to play in that as they have more sort of sway in organizations going beyond just sort of the things that have traditionally been part of the design domain and all those other new things that are part of design too. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I guess one answer, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, as, as designers, we have sort of a unique skill set. And I think that we may not be the people who can answer those questions, but we have skills that help us facilitate those conversations. And so, um, you know, we can get the right people in the room to have those, you know, to build that consensus or build that vision of what those, you know, those, those um, particular domains maybe should look like. What is, what is the model for, you know, I'm not a finance person, so maybe I need to get a bunch of people together to help me answer that question, or I can help them answer that question, really. That's sort of how I would sort of look at that. 
design and business are always going to be very tightly coupled. Um, there's you know, obviously the maintainability and efficiency side of things, like I mentioned onboarding earlier, um, also, you know, just being able to ship features faster, being able to make changes sweeping across the entire application very quickly and with no errors. Um, <laughs> Um, all of those are like good benefits, but I think it's really important to always remember that um, the design systems work that you're doing is serving the people that are using your product. Um, so like I think it's really important to constantly uh, be thinking about that. And so you know you're still going to be doing your user research, you're still going to be testing things. Um, you know, and sometimes the systems work you're doing, um, particularly in the digital space, um, can actually enable features for customers uh, to be done uh, more easily. For example, like maybe a big customer request that you're getting is that they want a dark mode version of the, your product because they have to stare at the screen all day and it hurts their eyes. Um, if you've done like all the infrastructure and systems work up front, then doing a feature like that is is a whole lot easier than if you hadn't done that. Um, you know, there's always going to be like um, business um, uh, like business-related um, benefits. Um, I think it's really important, um, I forgot who said it earlier, I apologize, but you know, it, it was mentioned earlier about having that leadership buy-in. Um, actually, my, my mentor's in the room somewhere. <laughs> um, he was really a big key part of that. There was like a parallel track happening at the same time that I was working with the designers and the developers, he was working with like the the execs and, and like explaining and educating them. And what was really cool was that um, we got support from bottom up and top down at the same time. And then um, Salesforce has this thing called a V2 mom and it's basically how we all um, are very uh, transparent with our goals that we're trying to reach that year and how we're going to do it and what our metrics are. Um, you know, after like maybe two or three years of, of it. I, I forgot exactly how, how long the time frame was. But the design system and adopting it was on every single vertical's V2 mom. And that was like really exciting to see because the entire company was making it part of their business. Um, and so I think it's really important to, yeah, like obviously there's the brand consistency and, and uh, you know, trying to make things coherent. But um, if you actually are convincing and showing people that this actually helps you do better business, um, then you're going to have even way more wins and more advocates for um, the work um, than ever before. Um, yeah, I think the, the more you can close the gap between a designer and the CEO of a company or the person leading you know, whatever mission uh, the challenge is, um, is incredibly important. Um, it, there shouldn't be kind of this uh, you know, wall between a designer and someone making, you know, direct business decisions. And designers should understand uh, the business that they're working in or working for. Um, you know, it has such an impact that it's just incredibly um, beneficial. And I, you know, not to bring up just MoMA and Paula Cher again, but if anyone has seen her speak about that, she made this chart on the current flow in which a designer got something to uh, you know the the head of the museum, the director, um, and there were basically like six people in between that designer and uh, the director, and so she said that's wrong. Let's change this and put the creative director in direct communication with that person, and that's how decisions were made. And so, um, and I think design is much more. I don't know, not acceptable, but uh, people can talk about it a lot easier, even if they don't have a design background, so they, they feel a little bit more comfortable with it, and I think that's to our benefit. But um, yeah, you, you should uh, understand how businesses are profitable or how the operations work of you know a nonprofit organization, really what those goals are, not just about color and type and grids. I mean, those are all important, and that's just us breathing air, but you, I think, should understand the real functions of an organization organization, uh, whether it's a huge, you know, Fortune 500 or a nonprofit um, making no money at all. So those are things that I would really stress to understand. I really like everybody's comments today. I want to offer a different perspective on basically my critique of design system 
and it comes from my experience uh, working in Android and then web. And I've seen the, the trajectory in web uh, design. We saw how all the websites kind of look like the same when people start to use Bootstrap. And I'm seeing the same thing happen in material design where designers and developers, they're, they aren't even changing the default scheme, the colors. They're just putting the same thing, and every app looks the same. So I feel like it, it, the system's making designers and developers lazy, and stuff is looking the same everywhere. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to take your comments on that. Um, so I think a really well done design system promotes creativity and expression. And if it doesn't, then um, you might not be addressing it in just the right way. Um, I will admit, um, it does enable people to just kind of do what the system says, um, particularly with the frameworks like Bootstrap and so on. But at the same time, it also gives a really good baseline for people to start from. Things could be a whole lot worse, trust me. Um, but I think um, one of the coolest metaphors I ever saw was at Design Ops Summit in New York uh, a year ago. Um, uh, Jim Kalbach did um, a kind of a talk. And the reason I say talk in quotes is he's, he got three other people up on stage with him, and they all had instruments, and they just started playing jazz music. And it was really, really good music. And then when they're done playing, he actually lets everybody know that they have never practiced before. They had never um, played together before. And the reason it worked was because jazz actually is a series of patterns. And when you know those patterns, then you can be very creative and expressive through those patterns. And I thought that that just like opened my eyes. I was like, now I know what to answer when people ask me, like, do design systems inhibit creativity? No, they don't. They should enable better and more, um, um, like, a, the ability to be expressive and creative quicker because you know those established patterns. And I really hope that the design systems we're all working on uh, enable you to have that freedom and that expression. If not, um, it might be time to kind of rethink through like your values and principles and what's more important. Um, you know, if, if it helps your team move faster because they're using the patterns, that's actually a good thing, but it shouldn't inhibit you from doing more than that. Um, so, like to directly answer your question, I guess around Android in particular, um, or material design, I guess speci specifically, um, I think that was certainly a criticism of the first round that we had, you know, our first release of material. Um, things did end up looking very similar. Um, I think there's this notion of like, are we compliant with the design system? Um, and that's something we've addressed with material theming quite uh, strongly. That's been like the core aspect of it is like really about brand and brand expression, and that we do provide a baseline now that will you'll be very it'll be very obvious if you're using the baseline and not actually doing anything. Um, but we're looking at how you can customize easily um, color, typography, shape, um, other characteristics of your UI such that it becomes an expression of your brand. That's going to require you to actually identify what is your brand. Um, I've had uh, design critiques where people have come up and said, our primary colors are white, and our primary and secondary colors are white and white. And that's like, that's not designing and making decisions there, right? So. <laughs> Um, you know, so this is asking more of the designers and developers to actually get more engaged because I think there was this notion of like, oh, you're giving us something and we're just going to use that to make our thing. Um, we are looking for this sort of further engagement. So we talked a lot about visual and components and systems like that, but we're going a lot farther now with voice. How do you see design systems working in, in that environment? I don't, I don't really have a profound answer to it, but I was going to mention that earlier about messaging and copywriting and, and tone of voice being an equal part of a design system to you know what a font or a color or a grid looks like. So I think that's really important to think about the components of a design system uh, and including tone of voice as one of them. And we, you know, that's something that we stress is figuring out that tone of voice in the very beginning of a brand exercise. And is it witty? Is it serious? Is it informative? And those things really do affect someone's perception on, uh, again, like trust of that, that company. If someone's talking to me and they're being all you know, making puns and witty. That's kind of funny. But if you're talking about like a medical condition, I that doesn't make me feel comfortable. Um, and so you know you have to figure out what that is and be consistent about that. So I just the great point to bring up about voice and messaging. And uh, so and one one of the things that I think is is great. There's we actually have teams here that that work on these things. And so even 
like there's always tone of voice and there's always messaging and that always that that's kind of like a table stakes for when you're establishing any brand but even inside of here we have we have a team that actually takes a look at something like the assistant it's like okay what are the appropriate personality cues and the appropriate personality traits of the assistant and how do those get expressed how does how does the assistant respond to you in a way that reflects those it could be in the verbal cues it could be in the tone of voice and a bunch of other things and so there's this whole personality aspect of things that are very much um, considered the other thing that i think is is important when we think about it yes there's voice and i think we should definitely do that and everyone should consider that. It's also considering the fidelity of the experience. So if you think of, you know, we have great, wonderful, fantastic magic rectangles in our pockets, they do everything. Um, <clears throat> but then if you go to maybe emerging markets, be it India, be it other parts of the world, um, they don't necessarily have access to that. But how can we assure that we're crafting systems that take into account those lower fidelity moments and be that through personality cues, be that through other affordances. And I think that becomes the, the, the red thread that we can be, begin to connect and, and build upon, but always making sure that it's infused in a way that we consider it across the entire system that sometimes and oftentimes can take it out of that tangible, like, what does this button look like? What are these colors? What are these typefaces? Um, there are probably people, I know there are people working at here, Google, who are working on voice, so I don't, I don't speak for them because I don't work on that, but I imagine, that I think the question you're asking sort of is like, you know, design systems are sort of more visual, like you see the systematic, you know, visual presentation of things and effectively voice is invisible, right? But I think that brings up an interesting point because you're starting to talk about like human interaction. What are the patterns that, you know, as Gina was talking about that, that are, you know, at the core of sort of how we relate to other people or other objects, you know, eventually, right? And so I think the, the challenge will be like how to kind of really investigate and understand those so that we are able to make things more, you know, seamless. Because I guess, again, the point of, you know, not being, not adding friction or, or challenge to the, to the interaction. It's not worth bringing the mic over, but I would also say the behavioral stuff that Dave talked about earlier pl plays into that as well. Thank you, first of all. Uh, I'll be happy to hear if you have any experience in building design systems in motion while building features and uh, while you realize that some of your decisions in your design systems, design system were wrong, and you need to go back and fix them as you go along. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this happened both at Salesforce and is happening right now, because I'm actually working on a design system for a product that is being figured out right now. Um, so that's interesting. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like I, you know, my friend Stephanie's here, she, you know, we could both tell you stories about when we'd have to go back and undo or redo things because new use cases would come up that um, we didn't know about at the time and we'd have to kind of go back to decisions and, and constantly iterate. Um, I've only, you know, been at Amazon for about a year, if you count the period of time I was consulting with them, and the product's not even out yet, and I've already refactored the thing I'm working on like five times. It happens all the time. I think what's important um, is to know, like, what your overall unified vision is, because um, that's going to be what helps drive your decision making and how to move forward, because um, you can, like, tweak and you know make little small decision changes over and over and over again but if you have that overall grand vision that you're moving towards um, and know how to like make those um, changes with grace and um, you know have like strategies like when you need to deprecate things or or um, whatever um, it's, it's important to try to think about that um, from the beginning but I know that's like really hard to do. It's like trying to see the future, right? Um, I think it's all in how you, you handle those changes and work towards um, those changes together. I mean, the motto of our team is design is never done. And so I think there's just this notion of, we're not exactly prototyping constantly, but it's like just the notion that it is this iterative process. And even though you've arrived at this point, like it is going to change. Um, there will be the next new thing or, you know, we can, you know, there's always edge cases, things that will maybe blow up something, and you realize that there's actually a better way of doing this. Um, and I think um, the, 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 one of the unique aspects of a digital system is that um, 
it's sort of egalitarian, right? You, anybody can make an interface, anybody can make a UI or an app, and so there's, there is an opportunity for anybody to really invent, and so I think that's also a responsibility of the design system to say, are there new ways to do things? And certainly for us, as we're trying to provide you know, more universal sort of ways of navigation, for example, like what are patterns that make sense and what's efficient, and you know, in the sense that you know, we're not the ones who are like, we try to know the, the right things to do, but they're certainly, we're not experts in the sense that we know everything. And so certainly being humble enough to like look out there and learn from what else is going on and sort of, you know, what, what can we learn from, from what other people have invented and, and are you know, exploring and we can maybe integrate into what we're offering other people. Cool. I guess we'll wrap up there. Um, thanks again to the panelists and thank you all for coming. And I just want to say thank you all for coming, and hopefully you'll join us next month for Design is Narrative. Um, have a good night. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you.